for and likes it so the, be, the meeting is being recorded but Hein Fleur is professor for application of business analytics he's the director of the zero hunger lab of which he will be uh, telling uh, in a short while and he is a true ambassador of the professional learning uh, programs and the autonomous academy of data science and so Hein let me uh, please go ahead and have a nice evening and have an inspirational session Okay, thank you, uh, Heer John, and uh, welcome, welcome to the audience. Uh, I really appreciate that uh, you want to attend these kind of lectures uh, in the Tilburg University knowledge sessions, as they are called, and that uh, with, let's say, the money uh, earned with that, that we can help some students who are, let's say, in difficulties due to uh, the COVID situation. So what I would like to do tonight is um, show you a little bit um, the Zero Hunger Lab, but also explain why we are involved in COVID-19 research. And the idea is in fact quite simple. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of Zero Hunger research. I will tell you a little bit about that, or I'll tell you quite a lot about that. I will also tell you about the COVID-19 research and how the two come together. Um, this is research, it's, it's, it's going on, it's under, con under construction, so no uh, hard results yet, uh, but, but we are uh, seeing all kinds of interesting things. And that's what I would like to share tonight with you in, uh, in this presentation. Um, let me introduce myself a little bit. Um, I love math. And uh, this is the math of maybe you recognize, math of the secondary, secondary school of my youngest. He also loves math. So and what you see here is you see here an H. And an H is what we call a variable. A variable is uh, something we don't know and we want to know or we want to optimize. But uh, remember that there's only one age. Eh? You see ages over uh, every year. I also love big data. Um, if, you, if you look to this picture, then uh, you might not notice directly that two and a half billion data elements have been processed to make these seven graphs. And uh, they are from a famous transporter, not being TNT, I did a lot of work with TNT, but from another transporter. And here they, uh, let's say the experts in the company, uh, they can really see a lot in these pictures. But it took uh, quite some effort to make these uh, things. And the final thing is, I love to make the world, um, I love to, uh, to make the world a better place. And um, this, this picture of this Yazidi girl uh, really struck me. Um, I was already quite some time working for uh, United Nations World Food Program with my students and research team. Uh, but this Yazidi girl, uh, when she looks to you, she's hungry. Uh, and uh, I cannot help her personally, uh, but uh, we can help uh, maybe people like her in, in uh, the same situations and I'll explain how. Um, so first of all let me let me introduce you to the Zero Hunger Lab. And the Zero Hunger Lab is, is quite quite new. So and I start with David Beasley and David Beasley is at this moment the executive director of the World Food Program and the World Food Program is based uh, with its headquarters in Rome and he gave a speech a really uh, thrilling speech to the United Nations on the 21st of April. And what he told me, uh, uh, what he told the United Nations uh, is that due to crises like climate change, war and conflict, and uh, especially grasshopper swarms at this moment in Africa, uh, around this year, around 135 million people worldwide are really marching to the brink of starvation. And so they are really in life, uh, life danger. This is not talking about COVID. We'll come to that later. And this is really the situation before COVID. 
So let me give you a little bit uh, background how we started, uh, let's say, with um, uh, this, this whole Zero Hunger Lab. From um, history, the, the research department in, uh, and especially in Tilburg, uh, we, we have become famous in, in applied research in logistics and in applying mathematics. And two times, two years in a row, in 2012 and 13, we have won the Franz Edelman Award. And the Edelman Award is seen as the most prestigious uh, prize worldwide for applying mathematics. And so it, it should not be something theoretical, but something which has really been applied, which has really shown results. And uh, I have won it in uh, 2012 uh, with uh, the TNT Express. And uh, Gia Chan was also involved in that. And uh, one year later, my colleague Dick ten Hertog, Professor Dick ten Hertog, he has won it with the Dijkhout pro uh, project. And because of, of his work, we don't have to pay 7 billion euros in the Netherlands. Eh, because our government wanted to raise the dikes, which, uh, looking backward, wasn't necessary at all. But this is, is not so... Uh, this was a little bit leading towards this, this work. Because some, some 10 years ago, around this time of this Franz Edelman Award for TET, we were wondering whether uh, data science or business analytics, uh, whether it could be used in humanitarian context. And one of the great um, ideas came from, from Peter Bakker. And at that time I was working for him. He was at that time CEO of TNT, the whole TNT group, uh, which is now uh, TNT Express and Post and uh, But at this time it, it was one company. And um, he asked me in fact this question uh, because he was thinking of a kind of public-private relationship between uh, TNT and the World Food Programme. And he said, hey, when I see what kind of things you are doing here in TNT, can't we do that for humanitarian context? And uh, I liked it immediately from the start. And especially if you, uh, I had already been at, at headquarters of the VFP. And when you walk there through the corridors, you see all kinds of pictures of uh, people in need or uh, refugees, people who are hungry, but you also see all kinds of pictures about operations they do. And um, I was immediately uh, sold. But then what, when you enter the World Food Program, uh, then you enter a completely, uh, yeah, let's say for me at least, a completely new world with a, a lot of things I didn't know. So, first of all, what you see here is uh, the world hunger map. And this world hunger map is produced every year by WFP uh, with FAO statistics. And uh, what you see is, let's say, how many people in a country are really, uh, really hungry. So, when you look worldwide, first of all, uh, 821 million people, uh, exactly that number that Beasley was, was mentioning, but that means one in nine in this world go to bed hungry every night, really every night. And then when you look to the world map is what they do is with different colors, uh, they identify how bad the hunger situation is. So in the blue countries, hunger is below two and a half percent. But for example, here in this dark red, uh, then more than one in three people uh, fall into this definition of the 821 million people. So they go to bed hungry every night. Um, so what, uh, what we did there is, uh, let's say after some, some pre-work, uh, the pre-work of convincing managers that maybe mathematics could help, uh, which they didn't believe at all in, in the beginning. Uh, but what we did is we developed a mathematical model. And uh, for tonight, I won't bother you with formulas, but I will try to explain it uh, via this map. And so this is the world hunger map. And what you first do is you, are, you identify where the food is needed. And so uh, let's, uh, as an example, take these areas where you want to bring food. 
Then, um, from all of their uh, knowledge and databases, they also know where to procure food. And so, you can pro procure food in Europe, in, in several places in the United States, in Brazil, Australia. And when you have mapped this out, then there are very many ways to transport it. And so, often it, it, it is sea transport and then combined with road transport in the end. And so, there are very, very many possibilities. So think of what I explained at the beginning of this mass of the secondary school, where you have one variable which you want to know. Now, if you look to this kind of, uh, let's say, pictures, uh, and you want to solve, and you really want to find the best solution in this case, so the best transport solution from, let's say, a procurement to the place where the food is needed, you need really hundred thousand. Uh, to millions of variables. But there's modern mathematics that can be done and it can be solved. And then you get something like this. And so this is then, for example, the optimal plan. And the optimal plan uh, balances the cost of procurement, of transportation, and of handling. So this is the cheapest way to feed all the people in the yellow uh, notes and uh, by procuring in the, in the red notes and, uh, and yeah, you can assure that the, the total sum of procurement and transportation cost is minimal. Yeah? And you also see that at some places no food is bought. Yeah? Uh, but uh, when I've drawn it right, uh, every place should at least receive food. And some places receive food from different directions. Yeah? That, that is all possible. Um, but when we were working on this project, this is what we call uh, optimizing the supply chain, then we were thinking of something else. And, and this was really a, a, a fundamentally new idea. And when you hear it, you think, hey, why didn't they think of it before? Um, but what we realized is that uh, in the picture which I just showed you, that it was specified uh, uh, beforehand what kind of food people would get. Okay, so they, they get, let's say, 100 grams of wheat, uh, 200 grams of lentils, 300 grams of beans, and 200 milliliters of vegetable oil per day. And then they uh, multiply it with, uh, let's say, 30 or 31 days in a month, and they multiply it with the number of refugees, and then they get an awful lot of tonnages. But when we were thinking about this, then we said, hey, um, people don't need uh, lentils or beans, people need nutrition. So what, what we did is we changed the traditional fixed commodity, uh, which, which was pre-specified, and we constructed the so-called uh, flexible food basket. And we included that in the supply chain. And the result is that we not only optimized the supply chain, chain but also uh, came to an optimal food basket. And to give you an idea, um, for example, in the traditional way, they prescribed that uh, beans were necessary and the beans were bought in Brazil. Um, but when you look from a nutritional perspective, then you can, uh, for example, beans, replace them with lentils. More or less the same. Not completely, but more or less the same uh, nutrients. But these nutrients, you might get them from Turkey, for example. Now, from Turkey to Africa, to Northern Africa, for example, is much cheaper in transport than beans from all the way from Brazil uh, to Northern Africa. And so what you see here is that we, uh, uh, what, what our research delivered is a kind of interplay between the supply chain and the optimal food basket. And now that has been worked out in a tool, and the tool is called Optimus. And when you look to that, uh, an Optimus is really developed uh, by my uh, students who were doing their master thesis in Rome. I had five of these uh, students in a row, and especially the third student Kuhn Peters, and he's still working for WFP. He designed this model, which I've just uh, described. <clears throat> and what you can see is here that 
a lot of inputs are needed yeah, because you need all kinds of nutritional uh, data, you need procurement data, yeah, how uh, expensive is it to buy one ton of lentils or beans. Um, you, can, you have all kinds of transportation and shipping uh, modalities, they all have their cost. Sometimes it's expensive, sometimes it's very cheap. And of course, and very important, you have funding. And because the WFP is funded by governments like the Netherlands and Sweden and Japan and the United States. When we have gathered all this data, then it goes into this Optimus engine. Uh, and this Optimus engine does exactly what I just described. Of course, there's a lot of uh, practical constraints uh, that, uh, that the harbor has a certain capacity, that certain people have never seen rice, uh, so you cannot ship rice to them. Um, and uh, field experts, they look at the solution, and then finally you get these kinds of plants. Uh, you, you see it on the map, how it should be transported, uh, where it should go, you can see when it arrives, uh, and you can compare all kinds of scenarios. Now, in this way, and, and uh, that was something which really struck me, is every time uh, uh, that we have applied Optimus in all the big operations in Yemen, Iraq, Libya, Sahel, we find improvements of 15 to 20 percent. And that, that is really enormous, it's an enormous amount. Um, I've worked a lot in these Western supply chains, and what, what I showed you in the beginning, but there you always see around 10 percent if, if you do your best. But here, really due to the combination of this food basket and the supply chain, we could come higher than the 10%. And, and, um, now, and the nice thing is, uh, at least the nice thing for us is that uh, Optimus is now rolled out worldwide to all the 80 country offices of, of WFP. And from uh, next year onwards, uh, they want to apply it worldwide. <coughs> But looking at this and thinking it further, yeah, because yeah, we are researchers, as you can imagine, we thought, hey, when you look to the World Food Program, um, th then what you see is they uh, serve around 100 million people every year, 100 million. But what we have seen in the, in, uh, in the, the hunger map, which I showed you in the beginning, is that more than 800 uh, million people are hungry. So there's a big, a big gap uh, between the two, still 700 million people to go, eh? nearly one in 10 people on earth. So what we decided, what we were thinking one afternoon is, hey, why, eh? based of course on, on uh, the results which we got at, uh, at the World Food Program, which is called emergency relief, eh? you help them in case of emergencies, it can be floods or earthquakes or drought or, uh, or, or these, these grasshopper swarms. But we were thinking also on the other side, um, maybe we can also do something for more sustainable development, that people can feed themselves. And when you start to think about that, uh, when people uh, need to feed themselves, then you need to think of what kind of crops do people need to, to grow in, in, in Africa? And then when you think a little bit further, then you see it is more or less the same uh, from a data science pers perspective, of course. Uh, it's more or less the same problem as what we solved uh, in the relief situation for the WFP. And so the idea was that in the Zero Hunger Lab with uh, better decisions with data science, we might help both. And so we might help uh, organizations who work on emergency relief, like the United Nations, but also organizations which work on sustainable development, who really try to work with local farmers in Africa or in South America. And that was, in fact, the idea of uh, the Zero Hunger Lab. Now, the Zero Hunger Lab is, is a kind of platform. Uh, I won't uh, uh, explain too much about it, but we want to be a platform where everybody meets everybody and where we can really, really help uh, uh, each other. Um, so hey, what you see here is, is the United Nations kind of organization. What you see here is the organizations with whom we work, like 
ook van dat honger heel veel solidariteit. There are all working in different versions on reducing hunger. And we are also working with, with Wageningen, uh, of course Tilburg, uh, also some connections with MIT in Boston. And of course, we also want to go to Africa, work together with African universities, with African business and with African governments. Uh, and there we hope to work together uh, via the World Bank, uh, because they have very good connections there. Now, this, this idea of the Zero Hunger Lab, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was, was very much interested in uh, because uh, our ministry gives a lot of money to WFP. And uh, of course, they were proud that the Dutch uh, could, could help uh, WFP a lot. So, what they have decided is to give us a kind of startup subsidy um, if the university would, would help. And uh, now, there's kind of co-financing at this moment, so the university also par partly finances this initiative uh, together with the university fund, uh, uh, also helps. Um, and these three together are our, uh, let's say, uh, initial uh, start funding uh, that we can do this work. Um, <coughs> Then over to COVID-19 research. And I go back to David Beasley again, because um, a few sentences further on what I just showed you, David said to the United Nations Council, due to the COVID-19, another 130 million people will walk the same way as these people who are, let's say, at the brink of starvation. And he added to that, that that will already happened this year. And that means when, when uh, his analysis and, and that of the WFP, when that analysis is right, that uh, after the summer, maybe 300,000 people will die per day because of hunger. Not because of COVID, but because of hunger. So if you look at the, the total COVID crisis at this moment is I believe around 350,000 deaths, that will be reached in one or one and a half day uh, in the hunger scene uh, in Africa, in South America, and in Asia. And so really something needs to be done. And um, when, when the first lockdown in fact hit us in the Netherlands, we were uh, still at that time physically together at, at the Zero Hunger Lab, and we were thinking, hey, can't we do something with our, uh, let's say, on the, our mathematical skills. And can't we do something to, um, to, to help people, uh, also in the Netherlands? Uh, and only later we realized that uh, COVID um, might have, uh, let's say, uh, an enormous impact on hunger. Uh, we didn't realize it in the beginning, to be honest. And so we were just simply thinking of the Netherlands and, uh, and then and we were suddenly in a lockdown, uh, people were sitting at home, uh, and you see the, the pictures, uh, people see each other um, via a crane and uh, through the window, uh, the economy, economy went a little bit down, uh, and in some sectors very much down. Uh, and um, so what we th thought is, hey, can we help with data analytics? And we just decided to give it a go. And, uh, and we reach out to, uh, let's say, uh, organizations in the front line, like uh, the ETZ, that's the hospital in Tilburg, uh, RIVM, uh, OCHA, that's the United Nations um, Disaster Organization, and uh, the, the organization, Lot C, uh, who works for the Caribbean. And as you know, we have some islands still in the Caribbean, uh, sometimes it's independent companies, sometimes as municipalities, uh, but uh, they are also in danger. So what we did is we developed a model. I'm not going to explain this to you, uh, but this is in fact our model where we look to uh, how COVID developed itself. Um, and I, 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 in, a, in a few pictures, I will try to explain you what we are doing. So what we have done is for the Netherlands, we have divided these 70 million individuals we have spread them over age groups. And that is 
already a difference with the RVM uh, model uh, because they, uh, it's for them it's very difficult to look at, at different age groups in their model. And what we are also doing is we look to regions. And we have taken the so-called uh, CORUP regions. Uh, maybe you know, for statistical purposes in the Netherlands, uh, the, our provinces are divided in kind of sub-provinces, uh, which are called CORUP regions. And our, all our statistical analysis in the Netherlands uh, takes place on CORUP regions. And we have roughly um, 40 of them in the Netherlands. And so what we did is, is we looked at the core uh, regions and, and we looked at the travel patterns in the Netherlands. And um, in this underlying model, we also need to know uh, when people get affected, uh, how this whole, whole infection mechanism works. And, um, and when people get affected, they uh, follow quite some stages. Right? They are healthy and then they become infected, but they have no symptoms. They are also not contagious, uh, but some, uh, in a certain stage, they, they get symptoms or they get contagious, etc. Uh, and it might end up that you get cured, but it might also get that you uh, end up in an IC or even uh, don't uh, um, survive it. And so that, that is what we do. What, what, we, uh, what we helped us a lot here is that we, uh, People from virology, from the ETZ in the hospital in Tilburg, they helped us to think about how these stages work. Yeah, but still, it, it is very little is known about how this uh, mechanism works. But what we try to do is to make this model, this corona model, and um, hey, where we can ask questions, uh, what happens if we lift all the measures tomorrow? What happens if you stay in the lockdown eh? from a health perspective? What uh, happens if only people of a certain age can go out? Because in our model, we can uh, work with different age strategies. Eh? For example, that you start up the ec economy uh, below 40, the age of 40 or 45. Eh? And we can simply see what happens. And not, not that it's per se a good idea, but we can at least see what, the, what is happening. And, um, Oh, sorry, I'm going too fast. Uh, and maybe also have, we can look to a kind of containment measures if only people in a certain uh, region uh, can go out. And now, when you look to this, and when we were thinking about this, more and more it appeared to us that, uh, that we need it not only for the Netherlands, but that we need it especially for our hunger land. Because and, and that's where we bring the two research fields together. Because, uh, and here I quote another, uh, not David Beasley, but uh, exactly the opposite side, an anonymous refugee. Uh, what he said to the newspapers, I don't fear the COVID virus. I will have died from hunger long before the virus reaches me. And I think, uh, yeah, he could not have said it better. And, and that is what we try to identify. So what we do is, in fact, in our research, or what we try at this moment, is and we, we have the situation in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we have relatively good information. So what we do is, in our model, we try to estimate the COVID-19 parameters. And with these COVID-19 parameters, we go to situations like refugee camps, like uh, slums in big cities, like countries in Africa or Asia or South America. And there, we try to forecast what happens. And we try to find out how it relates to food security. Uh, because when you think of, let's say, these kind of situations, uh, uh, these are slums. Um, slums are around, uh, here is a slum in Lagos. Uh, you see how crowded it is. You also see it here. Uh, a simple lockdown and a one and a half or two meter distance rule often doesn't work. Eh? Um, let's say the medical uh, care is not uh, what, it is, what we are used to in Western Europe and US and Australia. 
And so people uh, there are um, no breathing uh, uh, mechanisms. And so we need to do something. And so what you can think of uh, with our modeling is that, let's say, uh, that you make in such a situation, uh, here left under, that you make a certain containment and, and that you try to restrict uh, context between uh, various parts uh, of a refugee camp, of a slum, and that you work with certain age groups. Uh, because what, what we can do here in the West is we can, uh, at least for a short while, we can shut down our economy or, or uh, partly shut down our economy until the virus is, has come to <laughs> Uh, but that is simply not possible in many countries uh, in, in the world eh? because uh, you have a, a lot of people who earn their daily loan and uh, the daily fee and then they go home and from the daily fee they buy their food. When from one day uh, to the other, uh, let's say their uh, fee stops, they can't buy food anymore. And so hunger is immediately an issue if, if they do a lockdown. And unfortunately, you see some of these governments in Africa, you see a kind of copy behavior of the Western environment. And, and so they do a lockdown, but that might have disastrous results. So what we hope is that we uh, can help with our modeling, what to do in such a situation. And, and then we, should also, we could also look to strategies which uh, we don't have to uh, to look into but for example with this this age-based uh, strategy where you say okay all people um, below 40 45 50 they do their normal daily thing and they also don't keep the one and a half uh, meter distance and then they um, they get uh, probably a lot of them will get uh, the virus but they will survive because they are young and when we look to the to the, the numbers in, uh, in the West, and uh, you see relatively uh, very few young people die. And of course, there are examples, uh, but, but not, not that very many. And these countries, they don't have the luxury to, to take other uh, measures, which we can. And so what we hope is to help is with our research, and, and we are not, not yet ready, and we are fully investigating at this moment how it works. Um, um, but we hope to uh, answer these kind, uh, kind of measures, eh? so, uh, this kind of question. So what if no measures are taken? What if there's a lockdown? Of, what if uh, only uh, people of a certain age group can go out? And, and maybe we can work with compartmentation. And, and these kind of things uh, we want to, uh, to answer by bringing these lines together. That's what I would like to uh, convey to you tonight. And um, yeah, I would like to open the floor for questions. And I understood that the questions should go via chat to Khia Chan. Yeah. And then Khia Chan will uh, hand the question to me. All right. Uh, Hank, do you hear me? Yeah. All right. So we have um, this one question came in from Barbara and please other every other participant please uh, ah there's some more questions coming in now but Barbara please uh, can you uh, unmute your phone and uh, uh, ask questions yourself yes of course I hope you can hear me this Barbara Flugge from yeah, Switzerland yeah yeah great welcome Barbara okay great um I really like the presentation um because of the content focus and actually also um let's say looking into resolutions and not um let's say the problems and the issues my question is um, um to hein um about what would you call the top three success factors to really be able um let's say to scale uh, the optimal solution into these 80 countries so because it's not all about funding it's not all about policy makers so what would you say what were the top three or what will be the top three success factors to really be able to do to achieve that scalability? Yeah, it's a very good question. So we discussed that already uh, uh, a few times over the last weeks. 
and and because here we can look back a little bit because because it is applied the, the top three th uh, things are and then first i start with management uh, we really have to convince management that these kind of let's say new techniques in data science that they really can help and that people let's say uh, trust the outcomes um, and because literally when I when I came at WFP they asked me hey what are you doing here and we are shipping colleges and uh, but we uh, by playing games and uh, these kind of things we could convince them that uh, at least we could do some research now once the, the research results came out from the students then they started to get hey this is very interesting and we came up with an alternative so that is one uh, that is uh, management then the second one, I think, is, uh, is data. Um, what you see in humanitarian context, that there is not so much data. Uh, all the data which is there is towards, uh, let's say, satisfying the donor. Uh, because every NGO, every United Nations organization, uh, they should uh, give feedback, reports to the donors. And all the things they gather is towards the donors and not so much towards their own operation uh, so they they cannot uh, uh, let's say um, 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 yeah how, how do you call it um, no and, and the the third one i would I would say is really work together with the organization uh, because when you uh, work as a data scientist it's uh, for many data scientists it is uh, a kind of natural habit to think uh, to listen a little bit and then think oh i understand it i go back to my office or my research lab and i'm going to code and i'm going to do all kind of uh, data analysis but then you probably end up with a solution that will never be used so what what we did is we worked a lot together with wfp and every step and that took quite a while uh, every single step we discussed with them and this is the assumption you make these are the results we get, and and, um, and that that really helped, let's say, in uh, in making it work in the end and, and getting it uh, accepted. So these are would be my top three. Okay, um, thanks a lot. I have just one comment on the humanitarian. So the second one, where you talked about the focus on the benefactors um, and ra and rather not on the operational side. Um, uh, I opened up a project um, now um, for uh, vulnerable groups, especially homeless people and people that are facing home loss due to Corona, uh, work loss, home loss. Um, there are many people, uh, let me look into Germany, but also even Switzerland, that are not being able to finance anymore their rent for their apartment, but need to really go into a shared um, room facility or apartment facility as a as, a, as an adult, as a working adult, right? So, so where there's a lot of issues also on dignity, acknowledgement and so forth. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking here into a, a new kind of also, let's say method uh, based on engaging the ecosystem. So engaging the local cells, how I call it. And that's what I hear also a bit from, or, or what I also hear from you, right? Yeah. So yeah, to look into that, into the operational aspect in how to really, let's say, gain reachability. Um, yeah. and, and that's very important because what you see often is these organizations are uh, sometimes largely run by volunteers uh, with yes. the, uh, the best ideas, with the, with the best uh, uh, attitude. Uh, but sometimes it's not enough, especially in, in very complex situations. And there are these data science solutions. And we, and when you involve, uh, involve them, so that it's not a kind of black box, but when you involve them, that, that can really help them. Yeah, because we have a couple of hundred volunteers, um, just even solely in the US, for example. Um, and uh, we are now looking into what I call ecosystem thinking. That's, that's a method I developed over the past 10 years. Um, and um, because otherwise, it looks more into, let's say, funding, I would not say disappear, but funding gets spread into tiny little actions 
but will not, let's say, support the overall momentum of diminishing poverty, uh, poverty and, and homelessness, right? Or um, also, let's say, helping um, the healthcare uh, sector, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, there was a question of Hanukkah asking if the slides were going to be, or the presentation was going to be provided afterwards. And yes, I can uh, confirm that uh, the entire PowerPoint uh, deck will be uh, sent to you after the presentation tomorrow. So that was the question of Hanukkah. And then we have Rens uh, asking uh, a question. Rens, are you still uh, on board? Can you please unmute, Rens? Not sure if Rens, let me pose the question and uh, because uh, you wrote it down. And did you assess and include the impact of the meat industry on the world hunger problem? Uh, his yeah. microphone doesn't, ah, uh, his microphone doesn't work, it doesn't function at the moment. So uh, that's why you're asking me to pose the question. Yeah. So the question is, did you assess and include the impact of the meat industry on the world hunger problem? Uh, yes, that, that is a very, very big and, and important issue. Um, um, uh, uh, we are not so much involved at this moment in, in that kind of research. Uh, you see this kind of research in Wagner. And um, I was, lately I was at the commission in Wageningen and there, they looked really into the effect of, of going to a more vegetarian or even vegan diet worldwide and the effects. Uh, so th this is not our own research, this is Wageningen uh, University research. And what they found out that the, 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 the effects on, especially on water usage and depletion uh, uh, and, and the, use, the use of grounds is enormous if, if we could reduce uh, the meat industry a little bit, uh, because the meat industry, what you, what you now see happening in South America is large, really large amounts of the country and, uh, uh, and, and forest is, is destroyed simply because uh, we, we want to have our cattle there. Um, but we also need grounds to feed our cattle. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you really look to, to the total picture, then uh, and cattle, uh, yeah, it, it is there for at least uh, uh, sometimes a few years, sometimes uh, half a year, depending on the type of meat you have. Um, uh, so year after year, you you will even have to do that, and also the water usage is is, is huge uh, to 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 produce. Um, I just uh, uh, some time ago I read a study that if you reduce uh, your meat. A consumption in a year by only one kilogram, one kilogram over a whole year, then you can take, uh, you can shower as long as you want that year. But that's uh, that's the same effect, yeah? and uh, and it's only reducing one kilogram of meat. So there's a lot to say. But yeah, on the other hand, um, a lot of people uh, like meat, so there are a lot of cultural aspects uh, to it, yeah? uh, especially in in South America. People see it as a kind of uh, uh, well-being, uh, healthy thing, um, and, and so and, and, and there's a lot, a lot to do to change that behavior. And uh, yeah, but it, it has it has an enormous footprint. That that is clear. Thank you. Well, uh, th uh, thank you, Hans. Uh, I hope that uh, answers your question. If not, please let me know uh, again by chat. Uh, I didn't get any other questions in the meantime, so if, if there are any other questions, please post them now. Uh, in the meantime, Hein, um, let me ask you a question myself. Because uh, you were talking about the model that was used for WFP. Yeah, um, and I was just wondering, yeah, because you've, you've shown uh, uh, examples of using the model for the food hunger program, but can, they, can this model also be applied to other sectors, maybe applied by to other organizations, other or where would this model be very useful? In what kind of sectors or for what kind of issues that private companies are facing? Yeah, so what we are, and we have also been thinking about this, but, but not, not that much. 
to be honest, because uh, the, as you have seen, uh, the hunger problem is it's so big <laughs> that uh, the, the problem is a little bit that the, the model is developed by uh, WFP because uh, we have done the initial work and they have worked, they have taken it further and they uh, indeed have really invested a lot of time in it. Um, so it, it is not easily available for other aid organizations, but I think if you could push a little bit towards it, then it could be made available. So what I see in, in the first thing uh, is, is that we are going to help uh, other organizations by, so that they can apply more or less the same model. Right? For example, Welthungerhilfe, also a very big organization. Um, that's one thing. Then uh, the other thing where you might apply it is uh, what I showed you in the difference between uh, relief, uh, where you after disasters, and uh, let's say more development side. Uh, and what we see is that we can use more or less the same kind of models there. So what we hope is that we can help a lot of development organizations and local governments, for example, the, the government in Nigeria or Liberia or Yemen, and that we can help them with these models to find out what kind of crops they should grow in their country or, or the neighboring countries and to, to feed their own population. Now, I think if, if we are there, then, then we have really done a good job. But, but there you will see that, that there's also a lot of politics involved in, in these kind of things. Okay. And, and still, yeah, the model can also be used, for example, maybe you're pointing to that for medicine distribution. Yeah. You, and, and, uh, but we have never looked into that. Yet. All right. uh, so another question came in from Leendert de Jong. Leendert, are you still on? Please unmute your microphone. Leendert. <laughs> <laughs> you know one another. You're on mute, uh, Leonard. Please on mute on the left hand side. Left hand side down. Here I am. Hi, Hein. <laughs> and here, John. Hi, Leonard. And all the others. Uh, my question is uh, WFP is a uh, uh, cooperation of many different uh, organizations with different targets, different goals. Uh, it seems to me that it's very difficult to bring them together. Uh, could you say, could you tell something about that uh, cooperation and how it works? Yes, I can. Um, but uh, I hope it, this is not recorded. <laughs> uh, now, I, I, I will say it uh, politically. Um, WFP is, is doing a fantastic job. I, you cannot say it otherwise. They, they are doing, uh, they, they are serving 100 million people on this planet. They, they are simply the, the biggest transportation company on earth. Eh? Bigger than UPS and tonnages, bigger than, uh, than FedEx, uh, from the numbers I've seen. But on the other hand, yeah, of, uh, there's also a lot of criticism. Eh? Because by bringing food to people, uh, they become dependent on that. Yeah? And um, so there is, uh, and what you see is these organizations tend to become very big. And uh, when, the, when they tend to become very big, then you know what happens. Uh, you, you get all the, like in every big organization, it's not specifically the WFP, uh, but you, you get all kinds of political things in it. You get power games, you get ego things. And um, yeah, that, that uh, to be honest, uh, that was uh, from time to time, uh, it, it was quite heavy. It was quite, quite heavy to deal with it. But yeah, what we have done is simply step by step, uh, we have gone through it. Because the research I've told you about this evening started in 2011, 2012, and we are now talking 2020. And we are now rolling it out. But that is eight or nine years work. And that's not because the, uh, the things I explained about the, that the model is so difficult uh, or that uh, the data, data is indeed, it, it takes quite some time and it takes you a few years to get the data good. Uh, but a large part of the time has been spent on that people didn't believe in it. Uh, and then suddenly uh, a manager changed and he believed very much in it. And uh, yeah, this, this kind of, of um, yeah, 
of, of processes happen. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. So another question came in uh, from Mark Damon. Mark, are you still on? I am. Can you mute? Oh, thanks. Yeah. Welcome. Hi. Right. My question is as follows. Um, the, the model that you're developing for COVID at the moment, um, and in your, together with your group, of course, will probably have a, a very big or perhaps huge impact on decisions that countries or ministers, whoever, uh, decide to take there. My question is, what is your approach in, in validating your model in this still developing world with all of these uncertainties and, and how do you deal with these uncertainties? Yeah. Yeah, it is a very good question. Thank you, Mark. Um, that is one of the things, uh, but what, what we see happening, first of all, in, in COVID, is there are so many uncertainties, uh, but some, some data is, is, quite, yeah, is quite accurate. Uh, for example, the, the IC uh, hospitalizations are quite accurate. The number of deaths is relatively accurate. Um, and we have some numbers. And what we see is when we try to combine these numbers in one model, um, we don't get it, we, we can't make the fit. And so that, and that is already quite interesting. And so, and, and that is what we want in a few weeks time, we want to publish about. And that the numbers which we have right now, because many research groups, eh, they, they focus on, on a particular thing which they want to find out. Yeah, for example, how long it, it is that uh, somebody is contagious uh, before he gets symptoms. And what we see is uh, from the, the numbers of the literature, yeah, because we have looked at all these, uh, these papers, we can't make it work. And so there, there must be some numbers must be wrong. Yeah? And, and that's, that's the uncertainty which you are pointing out. Um, what, what we do, what we try to do is to identify which of the parameters are the most important for the spread and the prediction of COVID. And, and some parameters might, might not be uh, that important and others might be very important. And um, we try to figure out which, which are the most important, let's say three to five. Uh, and with these, we work um, also in, in, let's say in developing countries until, uh, and that's what we do in parallel, until new information becomes available. Uh, suppose that the people from uh, virology or epidemiologists, uh, that they find out new, uh, new things, then uh, we try to include them in the model and make new estimations and, uh, and then hopefully more accurate uh, estimations. I bet you are right. Uh, with, with the state of, of things we know now, uh, it is quite uncertain, it's quite uncertain, but uh, at least already now we see that certain figures can't be true and they don't match this job. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. So there's a final question also given the time, uh, there's five minutes left. So uh, and this is a question from Constantine. Uh, his mic is also broken, so I'm going to pose it to you, I'm going to read it out to you. Uh, to follow up on the meat discussion, who makes the decision on which nutrient or protein source to transport? Lentils or beans is a big protein source. Why not chicken meat, as an example? On what or who is that determined in the model? And the decision to go to lentils instead of something else has a high impact for some companies, like lentil producers. And is that Peter, you have a question? Or questions, basically? It's not, not completely clear, uh, partly because I couldn't hear you well, but it, it, taking on, on the meat discussions and, and replacing it with chicken, maybe it's good to realize that, uh, let's say, in the W3 situation, we are not talking about meat at all. Uh, because these are very, very basic diets uh, to let people survive. Uh, and, uh, of course, these diets, they contain the most necessary ingredients. Uh, they call, they have the, the necessary energy content, they have the necessary prote uh, proteins, they have the necessary fats, and they have the, 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 the most important vitamins. Uh, meat is, is no, uh, in no way in these diets. Uh, because 
uh, you should imagine that these um, uh, these tonnages they should be shipped. They are shipped over thousands of miles, and they are really underway for more than uh, three, four, five weeks. Uh, now, things like meat or fresh products, they cannot be shipped in that way. And so um, this is really to let people survive, and uh, and it's all. Uh, composed of commodities uh, which you can keep already for a long time and eh, which you which you can store let's say for two three months and um, yeah looking to to, the, to the, this question in general because I think it's a, it's, it's a fair fair question is is uh, yeah we should um, uh, or uh, Wageningen or other research group uh, and I think they are also working on that what if people don't eat uh, meat from, from cows and, and, and horses and pigs anymore, uh, but uh, more from chicken and uh, also from the sea uh, uh, and these kind of things. Uh, I know that is being investigated, but I don't know results by, by heart. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully that answered your question, uh, Constantine. Um, and with that, I'd like to nearly, nearly close the session. Uh, not before asking uh, if anybody has any more questions or wants to contribute in some way or another to the Zero Hunger Lab, how can they reach out to you? In the presentation at the end, the last slide is uh, is my contact uh, card. My contact details are in there. And what what I really hope is is that uh, yeah, that you, that you of course that you like this presentation, but also that you like the work. And if you know people who yeah, would like to support this work or have questions, uh, they, they can simply reach out to me. And my email is there. And um, I will try to answer as, uh, as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you very, very much, uh, Hank, for this very interesting, inspirational uh, session. Uh, and I'd like to ask everybody not to close down and to leave the uh, session. Uh, but to look at the short video of Frederik Knut, our Director of Relations, uh, after this uh, presentation. Uh, but after this video, uh, uh, the session will be shut and will be closed. So once again, thank you very much. If you liked the session, please uh, let us know through the chat, the chat um, uh, while you're watching uh, the video. And hopefully looking forward to meeting you for our next session, uh, which will take in a week's time. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you. Good evening. I really hope you enjoyed today's content, today's webinar. It was offered to you by TIAS School for Business and Society in cooperation with the professional learning program of Tilburg University. And I hope it was uh, exciting and that you learned something. And that is what we are as a university. We're supposed to learn you something and inspire you. And my name is Frederik Knut. Uh, I just wanted to tell you uh, a little bit about our students. I'm director of alumni relations. I'm also director of the Tilburg University Fund. And uh, uh, there is something that's concerning me. And uh, I wanted to share that concern with you. A lot of our students, especially the international students, are having a really hard time. Uh, many of them lost their jobs in, in, in bars and, and restaurants. And have, uh, so they have no access to funds. Many of them uh, have lost the support of their parents because the parents became unemployed. So they struggle financially. And, and we all know if you struggle financially, it's really hard to concentrate on your studies. And uh, that's why the Tilburg University Fund has decided to allocate funds to help these students. And today I would like to ask you for your support. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar today, I'm really hoping that you would like to, sh to show your appreciation by donating to the fund to help our students. Uh, we'll be taking the liberty to send you a SMS, uh, a ticky, uh, with a request for a donation. And uh, obviously, if you don't like this, please delete it, no obligations. But if you share your, my concern for our students, then please consider donating. And uh, that would not only make me very happy, but obviously it will really help our students and make them happy and make them able to concentrate on studies and uh, finish this year successfully. Um, thank you so much. Uh, hope to see you again next webinar and uh, have a nice evening.